Chapter 1 That Kid Look The long hallway of this hospital unit follows an elongated horseshoe pattern, with all of the patient's rooms oriented on the outside. These rooms have large windows and a striking view of the San Francisco Bay. When the light of the sun is allowed to pour in, the rooms feel airy and open. When the drapes are drawn shut and the overhead lights turn off though, each room can be as cool and dark as the cave of a snoozing bear. Some patients prefer their space dim and silent as they sleep their way through indeterminate stays. Sleep can be preferable to the other states available to them. Nausea, pain, boredom, or all three simultaneously. But there are other patients who seek the stimulus of the world on the other side of the glass. They spend their days sitting on the ledge beneath the large bay windows, their noses and hands pressed against it, smudgy marks left behind. They play with their parents and siblings, scribble at homework that not even cancer can help them escape from or watch movies on the big screen television that seems almost as large as a studio apartment I once lived in. Outside these patient rooms, nurses in royal blue scrubs, doctors in their street clothes with stethoscopes hanging around their necks, and various other hospital staff in green, gray, and light blue uniforms roam up and down the halls. The drum of their conversations, the beeping of monitors, and the occasional blare of overhead announcements ensure a steady white noise that most who work here hardly notice anymore. Visitors unfamiliar with the long layout often find themselves fully circumnavigating the entire horseshoe shape before they find the exit, which is also the entrance. Of the long line of identical doors faced evenly along the hallway of this pediatric oncology ward, most were shut the sounds of sick kids and their families distilled indecipherably out into the hallway. The room I was standing near was silent, though. The inhabitants within saddened and struck mute. The girl inside, who once laughed, cried, endured, and grew bored in this room and others just like it, died early in the morning. Her name was Lucia. I remember her cute, chubby face and the tight curls of her brown hair before it all fell out. She once wore the same flowery red dress for days in a row, despite her mom's ardent protests. Her large family sat around the bed where her body lay, sometimes speaking in hushed tones, but mostly just sitting. She was wearing that same red dress. It had thin shoulder straps. The small patterned flowers were blue and yellow. Veronica, Lucia's younger sister, could not be easily contained to a silent room. A shorter and plumper doppelganger of Lucia, she was happily playing with a small inflatable ball just outside the door, bouncing it against a wall and singing softly to herself. I first met Lucia a year or so before she died. I was a new nurse then, still walking those hallways in confused circles myself. She was a newly diagnosed cancer patient, leukemia. The first night I took care of her, I was working with a nurse who was training me. Lucia was sick and feverish, shivering in her bed. We had to wake her shortly after midnight to draw blood from her already bruised body to determine how we would treat her. Her sleepy eyes were wide and fearful of the advancing needle that I held. My hand was shaking with nervousness, while her hand, my tiny target, was strangely still. If they were interested, the bookies in Vegas would have offered equal odds over who was more scared in that moment. Me, or the prepubescent girl from whose body I was about to draw blood. Rivlets of sweat dripped from my brow as I pushed the needle into her skin, and connected to her vein. Still standing outside the door where Lucia's body lay, I was shaken from this memory by the phone buzzing in my pocket. When I answered it, I heard the muffled request of a mother asking for medication for her vomiting son. As I walked quickly to help them, I made sure to end the call from the boy's room. I once forgot to do this before placing my phone back into the front pocket of my scrubs, and the young girl and her mother were treated to the unmistakable sounds of a grown man using the restroom. I passed by an open door. Inside was a bored teenage girl. She was lying in bed and watching TV. Her skin was pale, 
Her smooth head was covered by a beanie that her mom had knitted at her bedside. A catheter exited at the point on the right of her chest and connected to a tangle of clear plastic tubes that led to a humming medication pump next to her bed. A tray of untouched food sat ignored in front of her. She waved and smiled as they passed by. The next door over was closed. I could hear a loud yell from the child within, but it was not clear to me if it was a laugh or a cry. Here, where the expression of every possible human emotion is not only accepted, but expected, it can sometimes be difficult to distinguish between the two. Just before I entered the room to which I had been summoned, I could hear the boy retching and coughing inside. I noticed Veronica, Lucia's look-alike sister next to me. She had migrated down the hall while I was lost in the memory of her older sibling. She was still playfully distracted in her own little world. Veronica was quite used to this place by now, a veritable sibling appendage. The bouncing ball had escaped from her grasp, and she was chasing after it, away from the hospital room where her sister's body, still in that red dress, lay. As she skipped down the hallway, her arms stretched out in front of her, she sang loudly enough for me to hear her words. The tune was some variation of a common nursery rhyme, but the words were all her own. My sister's an angel, my sister's an angel, my sister's an angel, my sister's an angel. (laughs) She sang between giggles. Clearly, One of her family members had tried to explain Lucia's death in a way that a young child might understand. Her refrain reminded me of a scratch record, upon which the needle was not merely stuck, but almost willing itself into action. The ball she had been chasing came to rest against the side of the hallway. Pausing in her song, Veronica stared at me with a blank kid expression that seemed to convey neither trust nor suspicion, but rather some emotion in between. It puzzled me at the time. Now, years later, with over a decade of pediatric nursing and six years of child rearing under my belt, it is a look I have come to know all too well. It is the same faraway glance that my precocious six-year-old daughter routinely drops on me when she possesses neither the words, desire, nor patience to tell me what is really on her mind. I wanted to say something meaningful to this girl with a newly dead sister something that would explain why this was all happening. But I had no good explanation for it. Only useless platitudes came to my mind. Ignoring me fully, she began her refrain again. This time, it was only a hum, but her words stayed with me. My sister's an angel. My sister's an angel. My sister's an angel. My sister's an angel. Then, for no apparent reason, the skipping record in Veronica's mind stopped. She picked up her ball and headed back in the direction from which she had come. 